Thank you for coming back so quickly after lunch. Um, this isn't the greatest slot to be trying to handle a topic like support programs and contracts, but um, I should tell you in the pre-meetings I had with the panel, some very interesting topics came out and um, the plan is to draw them out for you today, some of the comments from the various providers. So just without further ado, I'll introduce you to the panel. Uh, Mark Windsor is to my left, JSSI. Uh, uh, to his left, Steve McManus from GE. Then we have Alan Mangles from Rolls-Royce North America. And finally, Jeffrey Corbyle from Pratt & Whitney. Um, so we're gonna launch straight into it. Uh, this is a topic that is a very important topic. The programs, if we believe everything the brokers and the valuers are telling us, form up to 20% of the value of an aircraft these days. Um, and that's something I wanted to talk to the panel about because an aircraft being on program is sold to us by the brokers in the industry as being more valuable than an aircraft that's not on program. And we need to understand why. Because certainly from a lawyer's perspective, and this is something we, we want to talk about, there's an awful lot of difficulty associated with transferring a program onto a new buyer as part of the purchasing process. Um, so can we start with that? I mean, the, the contracts aren't the easiest contracts in the world to read, to be perfectly honest. Um, is that something we could do better, possibly in the industry, to even just make the basics a little easier to understand, to have the comfort to new buyers that they will for certain be covered on, on the same program, that that value that the brokers tell us about will actually transfer? Could we start with Pratt Whitney then? Yes, thank you. So a bit of context uh, on Prime Winnie Canada in terms of uh, the contracts. We uh, have uh, produced 100,000 engines over the years, uh, have over 65,000 that are flying. So uh, across uh, all OEM, I see Embraer, Textron, we've we got Gulfstream, Dassault, helicopters, and also um, very broad portfolio. In terms of contracts, we try to uh, optimize them per segment that we have. There's a few variants of them, and you know we uh, streamline as much as we can to cater for whether it's you know a helicopter contract or a business aviation contract. So there are still some non-negotiable items that are in there, trade compliance being one, as you know, and uh, you know some uh, you know credit uh, uh, elements that are to be covered. But we try to keep that to a minimum. Hi everyone, Alan Mangles, Rolls Royce. Um, regarding contracts, I think. Rolls-Royce takes a fairly simplistic view. Um, we, we've been in the business for aftermarket services for a long time, corporate care for over 20 years. Uh, we believe in simplicity. We believe that a corporate care contract for one engine should be the same contract for another engine. So essentially, our contract is simple. Uh, corporate care is corporate care, and it should be the same for, for all engine types. So we believe in the simplicity, and we agree with that. Um, and you know, yes, o over time we evolve, we do make some changes, but the grand scheme of things, we hope to keep pretty much every en engine type with the same coverage level. Yeah, Steve McMahon is on point. Um, if you're, any of you in the room has ever had an on-point contract, the on-point contract is 12 pages. It's hard to get it too complex in 12 pages. We keep it simple, we tell customers, if you're putting anything but oil and fuel in your engines, um, call us because it's probably covered. And that's how we consider the simplicity of the, of, of the agreement. Uh, Mark Windsor, JSSI. Um, JSSI covers uh, tip to tail airframe engine and APU across a range of uh, uh, portfolios and asset types. Uh, that causes its own challenges within the, the contract wording. The last few years we've definitely got it to um, a, a lot more simplistic view with some nuances per asset. I think the definitions are a lot clearer and they have to be um, than they were maybe a few years ago. Um, but I think that you know when you're looking at things like pre-purchase inspections or transfer a contract, there is a lot of grey. It's not purely black and white. So there, there has to be uh, the leeway within the contract to, to, to be able to kind of take a view on which way to go. So let, let's talk about that grey because um, that's the kind of stuff that keeps the lawyers awake at night. We don't like grey, we like black and white. Um, Alan, can we start with you? In, in terms of transferring, so the, the, we need the value of this program to transfer. We need to give the buyer the comfort that it will definitely transfer, that there won't be any surprises, there won't be any additional costs. 
but then you're going to presumably tell me, well, I can't tell you everything about the existing program because I have a confidentiality clause with the seller. So how do we get around that? Yeah, I'm not sure I know how to get around it, but I will give a little bit of context, and I think I can probably speak on behalf of my other panelists here that, you know, we, we have a contract that is specific uh, to the buyer, the operator, um, and, and that's specific, uh, and we're very keen on all of our compliance checks and understanding the background of that person, that individual, that company. Um, and so under a transfer situation, there's, there's two scenarios that um, can potentially get uh, folks into hot water. One is which uh, the, the, the person who is helping transact the aircraft is a party to the original contract with the original owner who is selling an aircraft and essentially uh, conveys what's in that contract to another user, another operator, another buyer potentially out in the market. So that's one big no-no that unfortunately we do see time and time and again uh, in the marketplace. Uh, the other thing that we tend to see which is, is interesting is that often we'll see an aircraft that we know is, for example, not covered by corporate care, yet it's marketed as if it is covered by corporate care. Um, and again, you can get into hot water there because the, the person who's transacting this aircraft is often misrepresenting an asset for one, but two, um, basically conveying something that's not entirely accurate, right? And I think uh, contracts are specific to people, to individuals, to companies, and we would like to think that that will remain that way, but we know that that's not always the case. I mean, one of the things we've talked about is, is you know, surely you can have a carve out in the confidentiality clause that says, look, if your buyer approaches us, you give us authority to disclose, it's paid up to date, there's no recurring inspections required, whatever, you know, whatever comfort we could give. because. We close the deal, and if we still don't have the comfort from you because you're, you're waiting until we're now the owner of the aircraft, that doesn't work from a legal perspective. And I know it gives a lot of the banks uh, a lot of discomfort in the room as well. So it's something we need to fix. It, it's definitely something that needs to be fixed. But, but there, has to be, there, there has to be the authority from the contract holder to be able to pass that information across. And, and I'm sure that everyone will agree it's in everyone's interest um, if a deal is going through to make sure that all the ducks in a row, so to speak, uh, and then that authority is given. Um, to, to, to Ellen's point, we need to fish out uh, where people are just asking for information and are not necessarily part of a, a real deal. Um, but if it's going through and the, and the owner and the seller are getting together and you have the authority from the seller, as, uh, then there's no reason why all the information on the contract and whether it's paid up to date in the terms of that contract can't be given across. Sure. Because presumably, Steve, the reason they say no is because it's not been paid up to date and, and they don't want... Yep. So, you know, the, the reason to say no is, is, wouldn't be a very comforting reason. No. So I mean, the, the focus, we, we would love for you to call us. Ask us any time if, if, if an aircraft's on, on program. I, I can't give you rates, I can't disclose a, a lot of things about the contract, but it also allows us to get in communication with the current owner, the current contract carrier, and we can start working with them on helping to that, help that contract move to a transfer. We want, we want that to be as smooth as possible, we want to be communicated with, and we want to make sure that all parties in, involved with us are comfortable. To, to, to that point, I think we often see, um, we often get communication from somebody who's involved in uh, the potential purchase of an aircraft, and yet we haven't been told by the contract holder that that is a, a pending um, opportunity. So that does give us the opportunity to reach out to, uh, to, to, to the uh, contract holder and start doing the due diligence. So you're basically there. saying ignore everybody who tells you we're not allowed to talk to you and give you guys a call. Well, we, we, well, if, if we you have the guidance from the seller, right, and we have a very simple one-pager form that says a statement of account, and then the seller can use this and uh, broadcast this and communicate with uh, the future buyer. So it's a matter of good communication, I think. So far as, uh, you know, is it on a program or not, uh, the rates are public, so you have a rate card by, so that makes it very transparent. I don't, I don't see this as being a, a big thing, but you know, the, the, the easiest way is really for the seller to ask for his statement of account. Is the account current? What coverage do you have? And then you have clarity through the whole transaction. We've coupled on this 
a insurance uh, or an assurance uh, note that we send and we say while we process the paperwork from one owner to the other, you're covered in the event that something is going to happen on the engine. So trying to alleviate some of the risks and making the gray more black or white. Okay. Um, Alan, can we have a chat about pre-purchase inspections, the, the heady world of PPIs? Um, because on most pre-owned aircraft, a buyer will quite rightly want a boroscope. And then you'll say to us, well, if you find anything in the boroscope, we don't have to cover it because it's out of maintenance. How, how can we handle that? Because again, that's a very real issue in the industry. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a really good question, right? So we, I think, at Rolls-Royce, we handled, handled over 300 transactions, transfers, if you will, of aircraft that changed hands with Rolls-Royce engines last year uh, that are covered by corporate care or became covered by uh, corporate care. And, and the obvious question by the buyer is usually, hey, you know, I don't want to buy an asset without borescope in the engines, whether it be safety, comfort of mind, what have you. If you're buying a $20 million asset, I can understand and sympathize with a buyer the reasons behind borescoping an engine. However, um, I think the, the point here is come talk to the OEM because contractually we don't allow it just for the simple fact of in aviation, unfortunately, if you don't have a reason to be looking for problems and therefore don't borescope an engine, chances are you can probably still fly. If you bore scope an engine and then find an issue, if the risk is held by the OEM, we have to deal with that issue, and that issue implies cost, right? So that's, that's the simple background behind it, but we're good people with common sense and we understand that borescoping can be an important aspect of a, a buy or sell transaction. And so we will work together with both the buyer and the seller to ensure that the right thing can be done and potentially an actual boroscope. Mark, do you want to take it for JSSI? Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, I I exactly the same scenario. I mean, I don't think it would be fair for, uh, for all of our programs to say that PP any findings that PPI cover uh, findings would be completely wholly covered because you're then going to get to a situation where a boroscope goes in, the seller's going to find uh, there may be some damage on the engine and the buyer's going to say, I want that repaired. It may be within OEM limits. So... Whilst there, um, uh, it, it's not fair, I think, to be able to say that we'll cover everything, I think, like everyone else, we'll look for an opportunity to work with the buyer and the seller to make sure that the program does what it should do. So if there are findings, and it's in everyone's interest to go ahead and, uh, uh, and, and repair those findings, then that's what we'll do. But you see, that's the bit that doesn't work for a lawyer, because it, it, it's like, do you trust me? My job is not to trust you. My job is to look at the contract and give the buyer the comfort. So, Steve, how, how, how do you guys deal so with it? We don't restrict it. it would have to, we'd probably have to add another page to our contract if we were to restrict it. It would go to 13 pages. Um, I don't know of any customer that just wants to go out and bore scope their engine. They just don't do that. And it's not for a reason. It's running fine. You fly it, you use it, and you enjoy it. So, and if a customer comes to us and says, hey, I'm in a, I'm in a pre-buy situation or a buyer wants to bore scope the engine, we actually say that's not a problem and we'll cover, if, it, if we find anything, we will cover it. And, and the reason that we say that and we do that is if there is a finding, I'd rather find it early as find it when it's a much longer time and I have a failure that I have to deal with at that point. Mm -hmm. And any, any buyer wants to make sure that they're, FOD, they're clear of any FOD or any other issue before they do purchase it. I wouldn't buy, as we say in the United States, a pig in the poke. So you don't want to buy something you can't see. Jeff? I would, uh, I would inspect my engines if I was buying an aircraft. Can't afford one, but when I buy a road bike, I uh, do an inspection. I check that the derailleur works, so kind of the same. Uh, what I would say is there's plenty of situations that, uh, you know, it, the, the, the airworthiness of an engine is not affected and, you know, it's very acceptable to have some level of foreign object damage and, uh, and also I would, uh, I would say that uh, it's good for a buyer to be, buy, to be, to know exactly the status of its engine. It doesn't mean that a maintenance requirement emerges from this, nor should it be expected. The OEM will make the call if there is maintenance required uh, to bring back something to service or to do this at the next scheduled shop visit, etc. And, and once the engineering report has been, uh, the boroscope report has been um, issued, 
and looked at by the, the OEM and the disposition made, it's absolutely in everyone's interest. Is there a requirement to be able to repair that engine or even some airframe work for the, for the, uh, the contract to transfer? Then JSSI would absolutely come to the party and do what it needs to do under the contract. So let's talk about what you don't do, um, what you don't cover, what's excluded from the contract. Um, I think all of you agree, no FOD cover. So what happens? I mean, has, has anybody actually gone to the insurance industry and to the OEMs and said, okay, we have warranties, we have an insurance, and we have programs? Some point, there must be, at some point, you're paying for all three things, covering the same or a similar issue or, or a series of continuous issues. Do you do that with the OEMs and the insurance? Have you, have you had that analysis done? Has anybody done it? What we don't cover? What we don't cover are actually... Or how you work together with the warranties and the insurance, so that if you don't cover it, you know the insurance companies so will. On, we are the warranty, okay, uh, as, a, as an OEM, and we manage through that. Warranty and, um, and on point are one and the same. Not being on, on point is a back-end warranty credit. Mm -hmm. Okay, you pay for it, you apply for your warranty credit. If, you know, if it's truly, you haven't been damaged, acts of God or FOD, then it will be approved. Okay, and then we will give you that, that credit back. Um, but did that answer your question? I, I can answer at least from a Rolls-Royce perspective. So essentially, it's quite simple what we don't cover. We don't cover uh, FOD and also not, uh, negligence, essentially, so if, if Unfortunately, if a mechanic uh, has an issue and, and causes the, the engine to be unserviceable, we don't cover that. Now, it's not always black and white, unfortunately, right? And, and I'm not sure a contract, as long as it may be a 100-page contract, will cover every sort of situation, because you could have potentially an FOD event. Uh, the, the engine is, say, just for, for sampling, is a week out before a shop visit. Uh, is it fair and reasonable for the insurance company to pay for everything? Maybe not, right? So I think there is an element of discussion uh, it does happen once in a while. I'm glad to say not too many times a year, but it, it's, it all basically means that you come to the table and discuss it because there's not really a mechanism in the contract that can unwind uh, certain complicated uh, scenarios. And regarding the warranty, I just wanted to make a point on that. I think Rolls-Royce takes a slightly different approach. The warranty uh, is a must regardless if you have corporate care or not. It has certain uh, protections that, that are unique, uh, but more importantly, I think a warranty is much more related to fundamental design defects, problems with uh, potentially even a fleet, uh, and, and we take that, take that into account when we calculate our corporate care rate, so there's no refund per se, it's already implicitly priced in to our rate, and therefore uh, there's no credit back or discount to be had. And that's exactly how we do it. Uh, I, warranty covers the part. It doesn't cover the other Sunshine hardware. It doesn't cover, uh, 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 you know, miss, in, miss troubleshooting, okay, but it covers the part that failed. How about you, Mark? Well, I think all three elements, it's not unusual for all three elements to be involved in a shop event. I mean, an engine can go in the shop, it could have FOD, which uh, the insurance company need to get involved in. There could be elements like Pratt's PPSP, for example, is a warranty program, so the warranty could be involved there, and there may be betterment costs that come under the actual maintenance program. So, again, to Alan's point, Everybody's sitting down, you're looking at the cost estimate, you're looking at the engineering report, and you're working out in kind of which category it comes in. Is it always black and white? No, there's plenty of discussion. Right? Plenty of times you're talking about, is this really FOD? How was it caused? So, you know, you might have to show some flexibility within the, within the program range. So, but again, not unusual for all three elements to be in one shop visit. The only thing I would add is we reserve the right to do an engine exchange if the event is uh, very high cost, and uh, we do this for you know product betterment and it's you know in the spirit of uh, making sure the aircraft residual value is maintained or enhanced as a result, and just it's, it's in the spirit of good uh, good customer service practices. Let, let's chat about RVs then. Why does an aircraft airframe engine being on program help residual values? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I mean, one, there's the obvious benefit, right? You're, you're paying a lot of money to maintain an engine, and, and that's being accrued over time, obviously for the next shop visit, but it's paying for a lot more other things, such as troubleshooting for, for service, on-call support, 
on wing services. Um, but let's set that easy example aside. I think a lot of times what appraisers or even in brokers that maybe don't appreciate are the number of days on the market, right? So if you have two identical aircraft, one which is on an OEM program or a competing program versus an engine, uh, uh, sorry, an aircraft that's not on a program, there is proven science, and the appraisers in the room, hopefully they'll attest to it, there's proven science that there are multiple, if not tens of multiple days, more on the market on average for an aircraft that is not covered by uh, programs, and that's money too. And that's, that's residual value over time, and that can easily be quantified, but is often not a point of discussion. And, and to your point, I mean, exactly the same thing. I always say that there's three reasons why a customer puts the aircraft onto a program. They're either buying, they're selling, or they've just had a really expensive shop visit. And, um, and like I said earlier, on point covers, it covers the shop visit, it covers in maintenance, LRU support, uh, anything that goes wrong. Oil and gas, call us if you're spending any more, any more, than, uh, any more money on that aircraft. The other thing, I, I echo what all the guys say. I mean, it comes back to what you were saying, insurance and assurance. Uh, you know there's gonna be an event. So if the event is covered under a program and it's you know, a million dollar event, that has to have an inherent value in the, in, in the asset. And there's one item that we haven't covered, um, and maybe, I don't know if it's gonna come up as a question, but one of the things that we've moved towards is, at a, is we've moved away from this old school diagnostics concept to where it's, you know, you send your trend data in on a monthly basis. Our industry today, we can, we, we can have systems where it, Every flight at weight on wheels, that data is sent to us. And we're doing analysis on a brand new engine as it, as it left our shop, and how does it compare? How does it compare it against the last flight? How does it compare it since it left our shop as a, new, as a new aircraft? And that's the prognostic portion of that, where we're looking at a crystal ball and we're calling a customer and saying, hey, you know, we're seeing a trend here and we think that you need to put your aircraft down within the next 30 flights, within the next 15 cycles, and find a convenient time for us to come in and look at that aircraft. Instead of diagnostics waiting for, hey, it looks like there's a failure, you've just failed that, and you're, 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 you've, you're off the charts. Right now, we're moving ahead, okay, in looking at that, and I think you guys are doing a very similar thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, over 50% of our customer, customer base are fleets of one aircraft, right? So unlike the airline world, uh, we, we become the engineering team behind the scenes. We become the diagnosis team. Uh, we become the doctor, for lack of a better word, and, and preventive maintenance is always gonna be cheaper, uh, and not only for, for the OEM, but cheaper for the customer as well, because you can plan to ground that aircraft at the right time where the principal doesn't need to be flying uh, so that you can actually go in there, do whatever corrective action you need to do, remove an engine, exchange an engine, so uh, that predictability and proactive work is extremely important. So let's talk about um, healthy competition. It, if I were an OEM or a buyer and I had a choice to pick one of your programs, why would I pick one over the other? I, I think it's preference. First of all, uh, an OEM knows their product better it, than... Put it this way, Steve. If I wanted to cancel my JSSI and move to you, we, why we would have that, that? We have that occur, okay? And um, I, I don't often see a customer when they're on our program ever want to leave, okay? As, as the aircraft ages, your risk increases as, a, as, a, as an owner. But if... A, and we've had one or two customers, and usually it's financial, if they say, hey, I'm not seeing uh, the value here, and we, you know, I've been paying on this for three years, and I haven't gotten my money's worth, we're saying, well, it's a long-term investment, you know, uh, but we do let them leave, and if they're not happy, there's no reason to keep a customer with, with, uh, on the program, okay? We do have them come over from other programs, and that happens. Yeah, I, I can't speak on behalf of Mark, but we're the OEM. We designed the engine, we spent a lot of hours making the engine, we, we spent a lot of times testing that engine, we spent a lot of hours looking at not only the, that engine on your aircraft, but the other 3,000 aircraft that are flying out there. We've seen the same engine, the same data, and, and we use big data to essentially be able to foresee the future before it actually happens. So I think that really, to me, aside from the nuances between the programs and what they cover and don't cover, that power of prediction and knowing when something's gonna fail before it happens is something that is tremendously powerful that I feel that only economies of scale can actually provide that value, especially coming from the OEM. Yeah, I guess uh, for this room, what's also 
important to know is, uh, you know, and, and there is room, you know, there's not an engine OEM that will do an aircraft program as a whole, so let's call a spade a spade here, so there's definitely room for this. Uh, you know, with the OEM program, you will have all of the benefits included, it's technical publications, it's oil analysis technology, it's trend monitoring, if you're not on this program, you have to plan for extra expenses that your operator is going to have to incur that are not on the, uh, the program. With the OEM, it comes with it. So from a JSSI perspective, we work very closely with the OEM shops and the OEM engineering departments, um, and they absolutely work with our guys to determine what the work scope is and what we need to do with an engine. Um, but whilst we're on the subject of this, I think one of the advantages of a JSSI program is to be able to transfer from one asset to another. So if you go from GE to Rolls-Royce or to Pratt & Whitney, you have the ability to take your funds over with you into different asset types. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Yes, <laughs> Thank I'd you. like to ask, uh, from a valuation standpoint, if I have the same program with JSSI versus the OEM, is it the same value or is one more valuable than the other? And I'd like to hear from all the panelists. Well, from a JSSI perspective, I would say the same value. Um, is that reflected in the figures that you see in the market? Um, I, I'm not wholly sure. So I would ask people who are a lot more qualified to me on appraisers um, what you would actually value it at. And if you're valuing a JSSI program at less than an OEM, then why? I guess I would ask the question, and beauty's in the eye of the beholder, it's what you want out of the program, you know. However, if you had a failure, who are you going to call? If you had a failure that nobody could figure out, who gets involved? It's the OEM. So in the last, the last uh, word is really in the, in the OEM's side of it. Who do you want protecting your engine? Who do you want telling you, hey, you can fly on? Or who do you want telling you that you should stop flying today? You want the OEM doing that. So I think during a transfer situation or when you're appraising an aircraft, I think uh, there's a lot of beauty and simplicity. Um, again, I can't speak on behalf of the other programs, but corporate care is corporate care. And, and you know what you're getting. And so it's extremely easy to value that program, right? So uh, simplicity is key. Uh, I would like to think that the OEM drives a higher value than other competing programs. Uh, but at the end of the day, if it's a simple understanding of what it actually includes and what it doesn't include, uh, then I think that's already setting yourself up 80% of the way there to make an accurate valuation, especially as it relates to the engines. And now for us, the nacelles as well on corporate care enhanced. Yeah, there, there's the transparency of who works on, on your engine that's important. I would say that has intrinsic value on the program. I would also bring the point that there's uniqueness in dealing with the OEM. I'll just give you an example that we've launched a ESP new engine option last year, uh, namely on PT6s. And what, what we do is for a top up on top of what you've paid in your engine program, you can get a brand new engine in lieu of an overhauled engine and uh, what we've seen is a take rate of over 70% on this. Uh, people going for a new engine. And it's important for this room to understand why. It's because it's the residual value lift that you get. You get 3x the lift of the value of the top up that you get, bonus depreciation uh, 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 tax uh, breaks that come with it. I think you've got, you've got these, uh, these elements that are non negligible in a solution. It may not be for today, but it may be for tomorrow, and the OEM is in the best position to uh, guarantee this over, over time. One Just comment on the engine arguments. programs. Doesn't the OEM have a responsibility to treat all their asset owners in exactly the same way from an engineering perspective? We're over time. Um, we'll take that one outside. But just to quickly finish up, I do want to ask you very quickly, uh, all four of you, what's coming? What, what new products are coming? Is he giving us the evil eye? Sorry, we're up. Sorry. Yeah, one, one comment on the engine programs. Uh, I work for a bank. I finance airplanes. Valuations of airplanes are dependent upon the engine program. It depends what the program is. So on JSSI, I think there were seven different programs last year. You have to read Schedule C very carefully to understand you have 60% coverage, 100% coverage, and that will impact future values. On the corporate care program, it is what it is. It's great. Everyone knows what it is. On ESPN, there's four different levels. So again, the devil's in the details, 
and anyone involved with the aircraft, you've really got to read this very carefully to understand it. And I'm greed. Well, what's coming? Do you want to start? Or? Uh, yeah, well, what's coming? Well, I spoke about the new engine option that we have. I would tell you that if you ever you finance some uh, PT-6 powered aircraft, we have uh, our program we call it especially for your PT-6. ESP is included uh, free of charge for the first 400 hours on uh, any new PT-6 program. So, uh, uh, you know, know that there is that. That's an easy one uh, to, uh, to activate. And we've seen retention that is uh, quite significant after the free period of 400 hours. Uh, we've got oil analysis technology that I, I spoke about a bit earlier. You know, this is 100 times more precise than the incumbent technology, which is SOAP, that comes with uh, the program. We've just launched a certified pre-owned program that also can help you in your transactions to uh, secure uh, and give some warranty uh, at the beginning of the transaction if the engine is not on a program. We are open for business for any buy-in discussions that uh, this room may have, so give us a ring on this and we can, uh, we can work things. We like the loyalty that programs bring, obviously, and we want to work more closely with this community. Yeah, 2019 is a huge year for Rolls-Royce and Business Aviation. One, we've launched our new service offering, Corporate Care Enhanced. So essentially that covers uh, nacelles as well. So thrust reversers, inlets, cowls, doors, you name it. Everything outside of the, the pylon is essentially now covered uh, for our latest engine models. So that's been tremendously successful so far since our launch at NBAA. So for anyone who's interested, even for new aircraft or used aircraft, it's definitely something worthwhile to consider. And it does cover corrosion, which I think is, is tremendous powerful so so that's one huge piece of news and the second bit is the Pearl 15 right so we're we're launching that aircraft engine combination this year the global 6500 and 5500 so really excited about that engine and that aircraft product so uh, watch the space so uh, Passport 20 on the global 7500 it's coming out with all the bells and whistles the Passport 20 also includes uh, the from the pylon out coverage and uh, that's the integrated propulsion system. So you have on point covering the in th from the pylon out. The other thing that we have launched, and we launched it a couple of years ago, and we're, we're continuing to retrofit more programs, is I mentioned the PHM, PHM Plus program. We're retrofitting current and older aircraft with that capability to have prognostic health management. And a very powerful tool. It's, it's one thing to tell the director of maintenance, I got diagnostics and he's happy and he checks a box. But when an owner sees that prognostic standard, point, the owner wants it because he sees safety. And that's the focus. Yeah, from a JSSI perspective, I mean, we're always looking at, uh, at mending our contracts to cover uh, a wider range of, uh, uh, of opportunities, for example, like thrust reverses, have a thrust reverser program. Um, there are other options that JSSI are bringing to the market with um, that, the bolt-ons that we now offer. So I think we'll continue to evolve. Um, the program will will definitely evolve over the next coming years. Where it goes, it'll be interesting to see. Watch this space. Yeah. Thank you to everybody on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.